All right, uh, we're starting our afternoon session on uh, body and action. Our first speaker, Asa Chan, is at the Department of Psychology, uh, Dikyo University, Japan, and he's going to talk about the sense of agency as active causal influence at an abstract action plan level. Let's uh, welcome Asa. Last time is uh, both So, um, let's see. Okay, so um, this is about sense of agency, and usually we consider sense of agency as a conscious experience being in control of one's action and or the outcome. So, for example, when you are writing something, of course you feel you are controlling your action uh, and also the pen and also the character. Uh, but um, this, this is not a trivial thing. Um, so, for example, you can consider part of your brain can also trigger the motor movement. And it's possible that uh, you don't have the feeling about it. For example, like the alien hand syndrome, uh, you have a weird action, but you don't have the sense of agency uh, in this case. Okay. So a traditional uh, view, how we have a sense of agency is like this. We, uh, uh, we uh, perform the action, and that may influence the environment, and then we got the sensory feedback. And internally, we use a whole model to uh, predict uh, what should be the correct sensory uh, feedback. And then somehow we compute uh, the difference. So if there is uh, uh, they, they are the same, then uh, our brain somehow create the conscious experience that oh we are controlling it because it seems the prediction. And uh, if they are different, then uh, we feel we don't have control and we don't sense of agency. But this picture, there's something very wrong to me, um, which is action here. So uh, the traditional view is like a pattern matching, right? I do something and then see what's the outcome and then create it. But that's weird because a uh, sense of agency always involves action, and there are not so much discussion about how we use action to, um, to do this. Okay. So today, I want you to forget about the previous things, everything uh, you know about sense of agency. We, we consider something like, um, maybe this is an inference problem. So we, what inference about what? Inference about uh, the causal rule. Causal rule we have uh, on our own action. And if we reconsider it as a causal inference, then of course we have an action to do. Then we can use the uh, degree of freedom of our action to optimize the inference result. So let's reconsider uh, everything now. Mm. We Today we try to convey to the uh, uh, the idea that sense of agency could be the outcome of uh, active causal inference. Okay. So when we reconsider this, uh, then we can uh, reframe these things. So um, this is like uh, we have an action system and we try to send the message to the recognition system in the future. If the information uh, channel is uh, good, then we infer that uh, we have a control over the environment. But if we inject some, uh, if the information channel is noisy, and what can we do? So like uh, in usual, if uh, in communication, uh, what can we do to um, get rid of noise? So we can use new coding system, right? So the, uh, we can change the code and to improve the communication uh, quality and information, uh, uh, information, um, yeah, quality. And so uh, the important thing here is, okay, uh, if we can do that in our normal communication, then we also can do that with uh, our action. So in a noisy environment, uh, if we really try to actively infer the our causal arc, then we should uh, try to change our action uh, to against the noise environment. Yeah. And second thing is, um, if this is 
is really hold of inference, then we mm, there is a possibility that we uh, focus on the intervention. So uh, what is intervention? So we uh, have an action, but if we try to change our actions, so uh, if try to uh, in, uh, put the intervention on the environment, then we should also expect some sensory feedback change as well. So it's not just about uh, action and sensory feedback, but also about the dynamic of action and uh, sensory feedback. Uh, second thing, the third thing is um, since we can do action, then how to uh, infer how much uh, causal capacity we have on the environment. Um, a simple way is just to try different action. So uh, if uh, this uh, inference, active inference is really important in the sense of agency, then this must tightly link to the action diversity and the action dimensionality. So yeah, let's start it. Hmm. Okay, so in our study, we have a very simple design. So always, uh, uh, participant can control mouse and uh, control the target. But uh, we can start to inject the noise here. Um, there are two kind of nodes in our experiments. So one is the real control, and so you have this uh, original uh, action uh, uh, mouse direction. But uh, we also have this pre-recorded trajectory. So we can combine the, uh, your real action and the code with different uh, weighting. So they are uh, high, uh, medium, and low control. And for help of trial, we apply uh, another uh, noise. Uh, so uh, we change the direction 90 degree. Uh, so uh, if, when you move your mouse, then it's not so intuitive anymore. And so after applying this uh, to um, uh, manipulation, then um, uh, the computer will show uh, the peak of different trajectory, right? So uh, I will refer to um, uh, this uh, original, uh, the trajectory generated by a participant as volitional something. And it is manipulated by a computer, then I blow it display something. Okay. Mm -hmm. And we have two tasks. Uh, first one is uh, recognition task. And so uh, you move computer mouse really for five seconds. And then after that, you need to answer whether this is, uh, this thought is controlled uh, by you. And so it's asked about, directly asked about sense of agents do you have control? Um, the second one is the detection task, and there are three um, dots on the screen, but only one is the target, and the other two are only uh, determined by pre-recorded trajectory. And so at the end of the trial, after the same five seconds, uh, you need to identify, they need to identify the target. Okay. So um, in this situation, we can say one trial, you can, we can get one relational trajectory and one display trajectory, right? And in this one, we get one and three uh, different trajectories. Okay, and then we have 25 subjects. Mm, this is the basic behavior pattern. So uh, we have a rotation uh, uh, colored by blue and yellow. And uh, we also have a three level of control, the X axis. So um, that's very intuitive. So for both tasks, self recognition and self detection tasks. Uh, of course, this is a no, low noise uh, scenario. You have a high control and also no rotation. And so to recall, uh, yes, uh, the uh, response, response saying this is under your control is high. And then, uh, if, we, if the noise increase, then the response rate uh, increase. And also uh, uh, similar in the self detection test, the accuracy also um, fall uh, when we add more noise into the condition. Okay. But I forget about that. Everything. Uh, so um, the real interesting thing here is in this test, the subjects they uh, participants they create some kind of pattern. 
in the experiments. So this is the data from one trial, and you can obviously see there are some periodical uh, alpha uh, regressive pattern uh, here. So these subjects, these participants, uh, keep joining this. And oh, by the way, this is from volitional, not display. Uh, uh, so this is uh, generated by themselves. Yeah. And very interesting thing is uh, every sub, every participant, they have very idiosyncratic pattern uh, generation. Uh, so from here you can see uh, nearly everyone they have a very different uh, pattern. And more interesting thing is this pattern generation is very stable within subjects, but idiosyncratic, uh, unique across subjects. So like this is with a uh, cross trial, and this is even cross task. So they keep the same pattern uh, when they do this task. Uh, so why do I want to do this? Mm. So first thing we can uh, obviously know is they don't really do this task. They don't move randomly. They do have an active, uh, actively to construct uh, this action plan uh, in some way. And also because it's very consistent across given trial, across tasks. So the internal representation, the action plan protocol uh, should be for on the low dimensional manifold in the uh, neural representation. So um, most importantly, of course, we want to ask uh, whether this pattern creation uh, is related to sense of agency, whether this can uh, really tie to their report. Right? So let's get start here. So now we have a kind of methodological difficulty. So their pattern are very idiosyncratic, and how can we capture it and how to quantify it? So um, actually, with the modern technology, it's not so difficult. We can use deep learning. Right? So um, we can use auto importer here. So the uh, for people uh, not familiar with this, uh, not familiar with this. Uh, so, autoencoder is uh, composed by three components. So, encoder uh, is to map high dimensional um, input to uh, the low dimensional bottleneck here. So, this is hidden layer. And the decoder needs to uh, reconstruct the input based on the uh, compressed uh, representation. So, this is perfect for our task. So, uh, we can try to reconstruct their uh, low dimensional motor plan space with auto encoder. So we can um, use a motor sequence as the input and try tell it, try to uh, reproduce the motor sequence and train the auto encoder. And um, also, it's quite fit our um, purpose, right? So, uh, so for encoder, it's kind of a recognition system. And the bottleneck is uh, like, uh, we will use as the action plan space. And then for decoder is uh, action generation system. And this is some detail about the output encoder. So the encoder part is composed by uh, just one uh, layers. And it's good for capturing the long term uh, you know, relationship, which means it's uh, uh, the whole action plan. And the decoder is LSM, uh, which is a recurrent neural network. So uh, it can serve as a kind of attractor model, and so we give it a high-level um, abstract action plan command, and it, we hope we can generate the sequence uh, to reconstruct the, uh, the data. Um, so the whole thing is like this. So in the trial, we have a motor trajectory, and we cut the one second moving window, and we uh, um, convert it to the velocity of the motor sequence. And then we put into the auto encoder then encoder part. So which, so for here, we can map their 120 dimensional uh, uh, motor sequence into 16 uh, dimensional action plan space. Uh, so by this way, we can capture uh, their action plan. So um, for example, you can see in this uh, example, uh, the two points are actually temporally adjacent, but in the action plan uh, space, they are quite far away. Uh, so we, with this way, we can kind of say, uh, so from this point to T to T part one, they change the action plan. Uh, 
uh, and this can be easily stayed in the this uh, 16 dimensional uh, action plan space. So now we can map every data to the action plan. So let's see if this action plan is really something they use for compute sensor agency. So we uh, take the volitional trajectory as the training data and for each participant, of course, because they have idiosyncratic action plans. So we train a uh, model for uh, each participant. And uh, we first try to, let's try to um, look at how we can predict uh, their response. And so because the training data is from self verification task, so everything we can find here should be cross test generalization. Okay, so for self detection test. So you remember in this test, there are uh, three display uh, dots, and uh, we have this volitional motor sequence. Right? So we can put them together, uh, not together, just we can map them all into the action plan space. So uh, the motor sequence uh, is a sequence, but uh, after encode, they uh, is a sample in the action plan okay. And so we can start to ask question whether this can be used to predict their um, response. So first, uh, we care about the similarity between action plans. So uh, we can compute the distance between the um, the volitional and uh, uh, display action plan here. Um, but the similarity, as we say, is more correlational evidence. But we also predict that if this is really causal inference, then they should also consider uh, causal evidence. So here we can compute the change of the action, uh, uh, action plan. And, uh, he gives this, this is, uh, we can consider this as an intervention and whether this change of, whether this intervention can lead to the external outcome uh, is crucial. So the dynamic of this uh, action plan will, can be also considered into the prediction here. So uh, we have correlation now and evidence and uh, for action plan dynamic is kind of, it's uh, total evidence. Okay, so uh, for each time point, um, we can compute the distance, right? So this is a four hole, just for one trial, and we have three distance uh, um, um, trajectory. Yeah, and uh, gathering them together, we have a distance distribution. Um, then we can just compute the RC curve for each one, and so see which one stand out uh, to others. And we can do the same thing for uh, action plan dynamic, right? So we can also have three RC curve uh, for the action plan dynamic for three dots. And what we can simply do here, we don't want to do too much parametric thing, we can just select the most, uh, the RC curve uh, with most uh, area under curve, uh, as the um, predicted uh, selection of the target in this chart for these subjects. And so there are six lines, which like one line and that line will be the predicted targets now they selected. Okay. So uh, we have uh, two by two, six conditions for each participant, and we have 25 participants. Um, the key here is, okay, if the action plan is really uh, fundamental, principle for computing a sense of agency, then this should be uh, able to apply, uh, generalized to all the condition and all subject, right? So we pull everything together, we pull this uh, six condition times 25 subjects, and we can do correlation now. So the x-axis is the ground truth uh, accuracy, the when participant doing this task uh, in the uh, specific condition. And the y-axis, this is the predicted accuracy. And so eventually the prediction is reached to point nine uh, correlation coefficient and very highly significant. So uh, yeah, in other words, um, this 
uh, with this uh, information, we can nearly predict everything cross trial, cross uh, cross condition, cross subjects. Yeah. And uh, it also replicate uh, qualitative uh, part of the group level uh, uh, profile. For example, this is the group level, group, uh, level ground truth of, of the use you saw this before. And this is the predicted one. So uh, you can see they are very similar, even uh, replicate the standard deviation, uh, standard error key. Okay. Then we can ask more subject questions. So first, uh, is the dynamic, um, the causal evidence really important? Then we can just um, forget about it, and we just use this as uh, the decision uh, uh, in the decision uh, stage. So when we uh, try to ignore this uh, dynamic uh, information, then the correlation dropped to 0.7 and uh, significantly dropped. And so, uh, so here you can see the, mm, the they really consider the change of the action plan into their uh, to uh, to perform their inference. Uh, and second thing is we can ask. Uh, okay, so they really have this action plan, but is it really core part of the inference? Uh, maybe we can just predict everything by micro action, right? So, uh, so um, micro uh, is, uh, is relative to macro, so action plan you can see is a macro action, and but we can also just take their uh, uh, velocity um, direction as the micro uh, action, right? So for for example, for each time point, they have their own velocity, but of course, uh, I forget to mention, we control the speed of the, uh, the, uh, the control speed of the dot, but their moving direction are different. So there is only angle difference. And so for, for that, we can use a similarity thing, so it measure the angle difference as the similarity measure and run everything again. So this is the original uh, uh, data, right? So if we use micro action, it actually dropped to point or so, and it's a huge drop. So which means the micro action cannot explain their uh, uh, response well, and but they really focus on micro action, and of course, that's uh, one of the reasons they do it, right? So, and also with micro action, we can even, uh, we cannot even qualitatively uh, replicate a group level uh, result here. Okay. okay, then we can move back to the uh, self finish task. Um, so we already can see the power of uh, this, uh, this action plan analysis, so, uh, uh, so everything you already saw is cross test generalization, so it's fine to use the cell model to test the self recognition tests. And so it's easy. Uh, we do similar thing. Um, uh, in this test, only, there is only one dot, right? So we can just put them into uh, action plan space, and uh, we can come to the same thing. But a little bit different is, uh, each subject, they must have their own uh, decision criteria to say, okay, this is uh, under my control or this is not. So what we can do here is uh, we can uh, use link one out uh, logistic regression. So we plug in plug the action plan and the action plan dynamic into the logistic regression and see if we can uh, trend on twenty five uh, sorry trend on fifty nine trials and predict the last one. So Here's the result. Um, yeah, uh, as you can see, it's an even higher. So uh, we can uh, reach the correlation coefficient to come back to, uh, which means, uh, as we say, cross trial, cross condition, cross subject. Uh, this just works. Yeah. And for the group level, uh, we can also very uh, well replicate the group level profile. And we can ask similar thing whether well, the dynamic is important. And in this case, um, uh, we can 
we don't have to do the thing do before because this is logistic preparation, so we can just take the coefficient and test whether it's uh, significantly uh, uh, different from zero. And yeah, so both for action plan uh, coefficient and action plan dynamic coefficient, they are both uh, highly significant. Yeah. And how about micro action in this task? Uh, this is the same. So uh, the correlation from point line drop to point A. Maybe you think this drop is not so big, but if we try to reconstruct the group level uh, uh, data, uh, actually you can see it cannot capture very subtle difference uh, uh, that um, when we use action plan to make the prediction. So micro, again, is not their consideration. Mm -hmm. They really more for some micro action. Uh, finally, uh, this is the final last analysis. Uh, so it's about our hypothesis three. So uh, if we can use action, and we should actively use action to explore the, uh, the capacity control, we can influence the environment or influence our body. So, uh, in, actually, we found in no, low noise uh, conditions, um, they perform more um, richer and diverse uh, action plan like this. And if we move to a uh, high noise uh, scenario, uh, they seem like a lot here. So um, it's very natural to consider that. So in a low noise condition, they have better way to collect, uh, they have uh, higher um, evidence uh, collection uh, rates. So after they uh, try this dimension, they can change to the other, right? So uh, we may expect the dimensionality uh, of the uh, high, um, uh, no low noise condition should be uh, high. And then that can be used to measure the diversity. So, for example, in every trial, you we have this volitional action plan uh, sequence, right? So we can do PCA here, and the prediction is uh, if it's in a high uh, noise condition, like a uh, like, uh, orange block, then their action will be constrained into a low dimensional. Uh, Manifold. So when we do PCA, uh, we should get a sharper uh, curve. And of course, for the uh, low noise condition, they can gather evidence more quickly and change and change to uh, have different uh, action policy to get different uh, uh, causal uh, causal evidence. So uh, the dimensionality will be higher. So uh, the PCA uh, distribution will be flatter. Uh, and then we can, of course, quantify the, uh, the, cur the curvature by um, fitting the exponential distribution. And we will get one parameter lambda uh, at the end and use one minus lambda to uh, measure dimensionality here. Um, so this is the self-recognition task. And this is the dimensionality. And as you can see, uh, everything is significant. So, uh, so the different manipulation, the two uh, level of control, and also rotation, uh, they all influence their uh, uh, action plan diversity. And we can see exactly the same in the VR test, the prediction test. So, also everything is significant, and uh, we can see. Yeah, the same pattern as well. So, uh, yeah, uh, okay. Kind of finally, final thing is um, so first we we find they create the we found them create this uh, very um, uh, special uh, pattern, and uh, that's the kind of evidence to say. They use the action actively use the action plan to uh, to fight with noise in this environment, and the action plan is really meaningful. Their geometrical relationship can really contribute their influence of their uh, uh, total role, and also mm, the action plan is uh, 
they're real focused, but not the micro action. So they create for purpose. And then um, the intervention, uh, the dynamical similarity is crucial in the causal inference process. If we take it out, then the prediction drops a lot. And finally, uh, they do actively use their action to create diverse action plan when they harvest information, uh, causal information. So uh, there's no, there's one more thing. Uh, we actually also have schizophrenia patient group, but I don't have time to do that. So if you want to know, uh, the result is also interesting. Um, yeah, just contact me. Uh, yeah, and thanks for my uh, co-author, um, um, especially my PI, uh, uh, she's here. Um, she did a lot of uh, work, and so let me have data to analyze. So, uh, yeah, and thank you for your attention. Can you briefly show us the schizophrenia data? <laughs> Uh, okay. So, uh, schizophrenia data is quite interesting. So, first, from behavior level, uh, this is patient group and this is health group. They don't, uh, in the self recognition test, they don't have too much difference. <clears throat> and when we apply the uh, action plan analysis, also we can well predict their performance in the action, uh, in the self recognition test. However, uh, things become different. <clears throat> so, um, in the cell detection times, um, they actually have a performance drop compared to health group. And also, with the action plan analysis, uh, uh, our, uh, sorry, let me see. Uh, okay, so this is, uh, okay, this is ground through health and patient. And this is our prediction for the group level pattern. And our prediction actually uh, predicts they have worse uh, uh, performance, but they actually have better than prediction. Uh, so, uh, which means they somehow have some information about their codal rule, but not including our analysis to help them to have a better uh, way to uh, detect the self uh, relevant information and but and also uh, let me check okay so this is the uh, dimensionality or diversity of the action plan uh, this is the health structure I just showed right and you can see for the schizophrenia group they nearly don't have uh, cannot compete with the health groups. They have very low dimensionality, which means their action is highly constrained. Uh, um, somehow they cannot uh, use uh, their action to uh, create a diversity. And also this is cross the two tests. And they are also very, uh, dimensionality is very low in, in, in the schizophrenia group. So, we have some conclusion here. So first, for the uh, self-detection, self-recognition task, they don't have too much problem, and the prediction is also very well. So which means somehow they adjust themselves, collaborate, collaborate themselves to kind of normal situation. But they are not really normal because uh, they do have difficulty to uh, detect the self-relevant information. So when these tests become uh, more like objective way to measure their uh, sen uh, sens sensitivity of uh, self-information, it doesn't really, um, it, it dropped the, um, the performance, but somehow still gain some way to improve their performance because our model uh, predict they have a worse uh, performance. And but eventually their action plan uh, is uh, is really uh, impaired. So they cannot create diverse uh, action plan during this task. Uh, so in total, somehow they have a problem, but they adjust themselves to be normal to some extent. So is their sense of agency impaired or is it normal? So 
um, as you see, so the, in the first head, the self recognition has, it's actually, you, you don't see any difference between groups. So their subjective uh, experience to some extent is fine. Uh, so uh, even they have a bad motor, uh, bad action plan, bad way to perform the test, but it's fine. Um, All right. Yeah. Sorry, uh, just very quick, very quickly, please. So it's a very basic uh, clarification question. So um, the topic of this talk is sense of agency, um, but it seems to me that uh, it's a specific kind of sense of agency that you're exploring. Uh, it's a kind of sense of agency that has to do with um, seeing certain movements and then detecting whether it's yours or not, or something you produce or not. Uh, whereas the sense of agency, um, the, there's, I think there's a more basic form of sense of agency, which is the sense that you're doing something uh, which doesn't present the movement in front of you, but like you're doing it. Um, is it is it fair to draw this distinction and say that your studies concerns only the former kind that I just described, or do you think that there's kind of a general principle that's covering both of them? Oh, that's a very good question. So uh, we can first consider those previous studies that use very constrained action, like press a button or raise your hand uh, to. Uh, to investigate sense of agency. And so in this task, we have more a degree of freedom. We can uh, have more uh, control. Uh, no, sorry. We have more way to uh, plan our action to use different action policy. And as you, in your case, if we don't have the sensation from visual from somewhere, but maybe we still have like proprioceptive way. Uh, it's totally fine. The point here is if this is an inference process, no matter what, we can use, for example, Bayesian integration to evaluate how much uh, uh, how much information from different modality, from receptive, from visual, or even from auditory. But the point is, uh, sense of agency here, um, we consider it's not just the pattern matching. It's a very active way to collect uh, evidence. So if we don't really have some model information on some modality, I would predict that they also will use what they have to get a, uh, to infer it. All right, we'll need to move on. Let's thank Asa again. Uh, Hyungdong, please let me uh, uh, introduce you first. So Professor Hyungdong Park is at the Department of Brain and Cognitive Sciences, KAIST and he's going to talk about breathing is coupled with voluntary initiation of motor and mental actions. The floor is yours, please. Okay, hello everyone, nice to meet you. Um, okay, so um, today I want to convince you that there is some relationship between our breathing system and our action system. Um, in particular, action system related with our voluntary action. So, for, um, so recently I conducted a few, uh, some series of studies on this topic. And actually these are like the results of first two experiments. So I hope last two study, maybe I can present later. Okay. Okay, let's start. Okay, so a little bit background and hypothesis. So maybe the, this readiness potential is the most one of the most famous uh, EEG ERP component, which was uh, found already in 1960s by Konubo and Deke. So I think everyone knows readiness potential, right? So it's the EEG activity uh, preceding our voluntary motor action. Like the after the this early finding, uh, Benjamin Libet. Uh, conducted a uh, follow-up study. So basically, Benjamin Libet was interested in the um, temporal relationship between this latent potential and our conscious sensation of the voluntary action or conscious intention. So what he found was that um, first, uh, latent potential start, starts like two seconds, almost two seconds before our voluntary action. And what Libet found was that only before two to three hundred millisecond, people have this conscious feeling. Okay, I want to move now. This conscious intention. 
So as you can see in this question mark, uh, people were puzzled why and how this resonance potential can precede our conscious feeling of intention more than one second. So what's the, why, how this is possible? So there are some uh, proposed idea how to interpret this relationship. So one of the ideas is that kind of determinism. So they say everything is determined by this our neural activity two seconds before. So it, it means there is no like the causal power in our conscious intention. So everything is determined by our brain, resonance potential. And the second proposal of this uh, interpretation, actually proposed by Libet, is that um, maybe at first this was determined by the brain, but we still have the kind of the ability to not perform the action. So we can decline or we can veto the conscious, uh, our voluntary action, although it was initiated by our critical activity. So it's kind of the very limited, uh, our ability of voluntary action. And more recently, actually this was most popular idea at the moment, I think. So this Aaron Schroeder and Corey proposed. Actually this resonance potential is nothing really specifically related with our voluntary action. It's just the neural noise. It's just like the spontaneous fluctuation of our neural activity. And by somehow when this fluctuation uh, cross some threshold, our voluntary action initiates. Okay, maybe these are kind of three prominent interpretation on this relationship. Hmm. So these are, um, uh, okay, I'm um, sorry. Hmm. Okay, so now I, I will explain the hypothesis behind my study. So as I already explained, so many, there are one line of research proposing the relationship between the sensory motor processing and our resting state network fluctuation. In this case, resting state network fluctuation is somehow might be linked to our voluntary action as proposed by Aaron Schroeder. So there is another line of research proposing the source of this resting state network might be somehow linked to our internal bodily processing, like heart or lung or skin conductance, stomach, and so on. So in this study, I want to link, uh, based uh, inspired by these two these two lines of study, uh, I want to investigate whether our internal bodily processing. Uh, most specifically our respiration system is somehow linked with our voluntary action. So that's the kind of reasoning behind this study. And actually there's one more reasoning. So there are actually, there are many studies uh, in particular in animal models uh, investigating the relationship between our breathing and uh, our action system, mostly repetitive and rhythmic actions like whisking in mice you can see in this study. However, no one investigated whether breathing can affect very high level motor cognition like our voluntary action. So these are two main reasoning behind this story. So our hypothesis was that respiratory system might infect our voluntary action. Okay, so test was uh, uh, very simple indeed. We what we do was the what we did was the just simple libet task. We additionally measured uh, breathing system at the same time. So this is main behavioral finding. Uh, so this is kind of circular histogram. Uh, this is just the histogram indicating the the histogram indicates the onset of the voluntary action as a function of our breathing phase. So here phase zero uh, simply indicates they initiate their voluntary action while the beginning of their expiration. So as you can see here, breathing out and phase pi indicates the beginning of inspiration. So if someone pressed here, it means the beginning of inspiration. 
So if there is no relationship between breathing phase and the voluntary action, this histogram should be kind of the uniformly distributed. But as you can see here, it's much more concentrated on the, this upper side, which is the basically corresponding to the expiration phase, so while breathing out. Actually, actually they prefer a little bit later, the, this late phase of breathing out. So importantly, uh, when we asked people after they conducted the experiments, no one realized that they there is some conscious there is some any relationship between the breathing and the voluntary action. So everything was uh, unconscious. Okay, so there is uh, the behavioral finding suggesting our breathing system, our uh, timing of our voluntary action is synchronized with our breathing phase. And then we further analyzed the resonance potential. So as you can see here, already two seconds before the voluntary action, we can see this resonance potential. And this figure on the right bottom is the, the amplitude of resonance potential as a function of the respiration phase. So X axis correspond to the breathing phase in each single trial, as you can see here. So basically, these are the same figure, right? So these are based on the resonance potential as a function of time. But this one is the resonance potential as a function of the breathing phase. We just analyze in each trial, we check the, the breathing phase, and we just plotted the resonance potential amplitude. So again, if there is no relationship between respiration phase and the resonance potential, this should be flat, right? But as you can see here, there is more negative latent potential during expiration, right? So more negative means more latent potential activity. So I mean, it corresponds, right? So because people, when they press the button, usually they in the middle of the breathing out, right? So during the breathing out phase, probably corresponding around here, there is more resonance potential. So although this is a mere correlational study, so in brief, we found the interrelationship between these three components, voluntary action timing and resonance potential and breathing. Okay, so what this research can indicate. I mean, there are some other additional analysis and control analysis, but these are all the <clears throat> main findings. So I suggest maybe you remember that this uh, the question the people puzzled the disorder between resonance potential and conscious intention and action. How this resonance potential can precede this conscious intention? So our finding provides kind of the physiological explanation on this relationship. So resonance potential reflects our cortical activity associated with our resting state, uh, resting state breathing. And then um, people have conscious intention and they perform the voluntary action. So our research suggests this resonance potential is not noise, as proposed by Aaron Schroger, because at least it is associated to our breathing phase. And we still have our conscious intention because, I mean, it is not determined by uh, resonance potential. It just reflects some our bodily signal, which is breathing system. Okay, so this was the first study. And I want to also present the follow-up study. So our next question, was that um, what happens if there is no action? Kind of so meaning um, our breathing can still have influence on our mental action without motor action. So I will explain briefly why we thought about this idea. So as I briefly mentioned, there are this long line of study like investigating our breathing system and our motor action like running in horses or whisking in mice. So as I mentioned, this study investigated the 
the relationship between our breathing system and low level motor control, usually repetitive and rhythmic, like running and whisking. And as I show you, so we further investigated, the breathing can still impact our timing of voluntary action, which is not rhythmic and which is um, not repetitive. So it's, that's why we think voluntary action is kind of the high level motor action compared to running and whisking. So our question, next question was how about even higher level of actions? Like motor imagery, so imagining motor action without actually performing the task, motor action, or even visual imagery. So there is no motor component at all. You just imagine something which is not related with our motor action. Okay, so we again conducted some modified version of the Rebet task. So there are three tasks. First one is motor action. So press the button whenever you want. And motor imagery. So imagine pressing the button whenever you want. So they just imagine pressing the button, but without this overt uh, motor movement. And third one was visual imagery. So instruction was that imagine stopping the cr clock hand uh, rotation whenever you want. So it's kind of the taking a mental picture or snapshot. So these are the um, first results. So this is, uh, is the results from the, this first condition when actually pressing the button. So these are same data, but left column indicates the, this button pressing condition using the this uh, button pressing as a trigger, right? We have the trigger in each trial, which is marked by the button press. So on the contrary, right button was based on uh, their bubble report, retrospective bubble report of when they uh, press the button. So the, the reason we compare these two conditions is that because in these two conditions, motor imagery and visual imagery, uh, there is no way to record the timing of the action performance, right? So that's why we collected the timing of the uh, imagery performance retrospectively. So after the clock rotate, the clock rotation finish, so they have to retrospectively report when they perform the task. As you can imagine, I mean, maybe someone say it's completely, we cannot rely on such a mental retrospection, right? Or someone can more likely imagine, okay, maybe that's possible, but that's not too precise. That's very, that's just not precise enough for using the data analysis. Maybe some of you already have some similar feeling. So that's why we perform this task. So left one is the using the button press, so precise trigger. And right one is the same data using the button press. But now we are using the trigger um, with the, this, the retrospective bubble report. Okay, I hope this makes sense. So as you can see here, in both way, we can find significant coupling between breathing and voluntary action. So this is the results of this statistical test using permutation test. Um, so as you can see, the effect size is bigger in when using the button press as a trigger, probably because it's more precise, but still we can find this significant finding. And this is the results of the, this EMG. So as you can see clearly, the, this is EMG of the finger. So when we use the trigger or button press, um, it's kind of precise, just around time zero. But when we use the uh, bubble retrospective report as a trigger, which is time zero here, the EMG is kind of less precise. It's a bit spread and jittered around time zero. But still, this suggests our bubble report, retrospective report, uh, is reliable. 
although that's not perfect. Okay, so this is the main finding. So left one um, is the results of the motor imagery and right one is the visual imagery. So as you can see here, we still found a significant coupling between our breathing phase and more timing of the motor imagery. So even you don't perform any motor task, so your, the timing of your motor imagery is constrained by your breathing pattern. And the light one is, I think this is the most interesting condition. I remember my supervisor said, oh, this is, should be just control condition. I mean, breathing cannot impact the timing of the, our mental visual imagery. Maybe someone also think like that, but still, we could found a significant coupling between the, our breathing phase and the timing of the pure visual imagery, like the stopping some visual imagery. Hmm. So these are the results of EMG, showing there is no, indeed, they didn't move their finger. Hmm. Okay, so this is the results of the Levinis potential. Mm. So this red, blue, yellow, black correspond to resonance potential of the visual imagery, motor imagery, and motor execution using the reported time, bubble report, and black correspond to the this key press time. Mm. So maybe someone surprised how this visual imagery um, can be associated with the resonance potential because people usually think um, resonance potential requires, necessitates some of our motor action or motor imagery. Mm. So this finding uh, is also, I think, interesting and suggests the resonance potential is not specifically linked to our motor action. It's more related with uh, like general uh, action. As you might know, in the dictionary, the action, actually the definition of action doesn't include associated with any motor system. So doing something for any purpose, I remember that's the definition of the action. So this research suggests uh, resonance potential uh, might be not specifically linked to our motor system, actually already suggested by the Aaron Schroeder. Mm. Okay, okay, I think this is the final result. Actually, this is just a replication of the previous finding. You might remember this figure. So this is again the resonance potential as a function of the respiration phase. Again, we found we more stronger, a more negative uh, resonance potential amplitude while breathing out compared to the this breathing in phase. Uh, okay, sorry, I, uh, I, I lost a bit. Uh, okay, so these are discussions. So I want to emphasize three points. Okay, so in this study, we show that the breathing still impacts our mental action. Hmm which uh, is not accompanied by our overt motor action. So I think this finding is to maybe the suggest uh, breathing impacts very, very high level uh, motor cognition. Actually, I'm looking for, is there any higher mental action than visual imagery? So if someone has some good suggestion, please let me know. Mm. And second suggestion, uh, is that this is the kind of the physiological model for the behind our voluntary action proposed by Hubbard. So he proposed there are like three stages, like deliberation, prior intention, and second, there is like the preparation and readiness potential. And there is a lateralization phase, which actually the brain sends the signal to the hand. So our findings suggest um, when 
this breathing action coupling occurs among these three phase, right? So I hope you remember we found breathing action coupling regardless of the actual involvement of this uh, hand specific phase. So this thing, the breathing action coupling occurs before the actual hand uh, specific uh, preparation phase. We don't know whether it is a deliberation or preparation, but it is before the involvement of our hand uh, action. Okay, and then last question might be, and where in the brain happens this uh, interaction between brain and our breathing system? So again, um, this is the neural framework proposed by Haggard. So basic ganglia, they, our conscious intention initiated, and then our motor preparation uh, occurs in pre-SMA and the motor cortex sends motor signal to the, our hand. Uh, actually, so I speculate where our this uh, interaction between breathing and action occurs. So there are two um, supporting evidence. So first one is that uh, this Nasheb and Ador proposed that this pre-SMA is involved in the more general cognitive action control. Actually, he also emphasized this SMA is involved in the more general action planning and control not specifically linked with our hand movement or any limb movement. So more general, pre general preparation phase. And this uh, next evidence uh, proposed, so previously it was proposed that breathing system is involved only in the like, brain stem. There are some specific nucleus associated to our uh, breathing at last. And previously, people usually thought that our uh, voluntary breathing is involved in the motor cortex or supplementary motor area. But this recent study found even our breathing at last is involved in the brainstem and uh, this uh, SMA area and M1 area as well, even at last. So it's not like it's two independent system, even at last they are interacting. So this three line of evidence suggests that our finding that this breathing at last somehow impacts our voluntary action during motor preparation phase uh, might occur in this pre-SMA or SMA area before reaching to the motor cortex. Okay, so that was the three points I want to emphasize. Okay, and you might remember, actually, I conducted two more studies. So I think the main limitation of these two studies was that they are purely um, correlational, right? So we don't know which one affects which, or maybe that's the mere coincidence and so on. Actually, regarding this second uh, idea, recently Aaron Schrager published paper in Trends in Cognitive Science, and he interpreted our results as a pure coincidence. There is no causal link between resonance potential and breathing. So we wanted to conduct some causal study um, between resonance potential and breathing phase. So basically we investigated what happens uh, when we experimentally alter our breathing phase, what happens in our resonance potential. Mm. And uh, in the first question, is that also this is also important control so someone i remember when i found when i our public paper was published on the twitter many people said oh that's what i do during our workout like the, during push-up you always synchronize your breathing and your action so they think this is purely some motor coordination not involving high level motor uh, motor cortex so we conducted uh, these two study and still analyzing the data. So I hope I can present this some some time. Okay. 
Okay, thank you for your attention. Okay, thanks for a very interesting topic. And uh, but I was wondering that uh, since participants have to uh, retrospectively report the timing that they did they did the action, I was thinking if there, if there's any possibility that the breathing in and breathing out affect our strength of memory encoding. So if this is true, then the when when participant retrospectively uh, think what, what, what's the timing they press, they might tend to choose the timing that couple with like, maybe like breathing out, which gives them a more um more uh, more uh, give them a stronger memory strength to bias yeah. their response. Yeah, that's interesting possibility, I, which I want to test using experiment. Basically, I don't have an answer, but th I think that's an interesting possibility. Maybe just they have some preference due to the memory, I don't know. Maybe they have some preference for the, this uh, memory, some, some specific breathing phase, right? Yeah, so I think that's interesting possibility, which I don't have an answer now. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the talk. It was so fun. Uh, I have a question about the visual visual measure task. So mm -hmm. several studies have reported that uh, in in the in the motor measure task, participants uh, a considerable number of participants just fail to activate their uh, motor cortex despite their you know their debrief report that they have tried to it. Uh, mm -hmm. And one of the interpretation was that. Uh, the, the participants, participants simply confuse the commands to make uh, make the more imagery, ima more imagination. Uh, they interpret that command as something like you know visualizing, like they were asked to re imagine raising raising your left arm, but instead mm -hmm. they just imagine a visually imagination that you know the, the scenery. So my question mm -hmm. is, is it? Possible that your participant might have confused to make visualize instead mm -hmm. of doing this more command mm -hmm. because they just do not really you know it's it's very often I mean the, the, there has been many reports that participant high portion of participants just make confusions about this uh, more mm -hmm. commands. Mm -hmm. So what do you think about this? Yeah, yeah. So that's that's also an important question. So actually, in the literature. There are two types of the instruction. So first to group, they prepare to not to confuse this visual part component. So they really emphasize you have to actually imagine moving your finger, emphasizing more motor components. On the contrary, there is some another group. They intentionally not emphasize motor components. It's kind of the mixing this motor components and visual components. So our instruction was actually like the this uh, second component we didn't too much emphasize motor components and and actually our results suggest that this uh, breathing system is associated uh, with more like the this um uh, how can I? even we didn't restrict it uh, they uh, even we included both motor and visual imagery component in this com condition, the effect was still significant. Mm. I, I don't know, but my guess was that uh, if we restrict it only to the, this motor, very strict uh, sense of this motor imagination, the effect might be even more stronger. So if we couldn't find significant coupling between in this condition, maybe that's the reason, because the instruction was not strict, strict. we couldn't find uh, the coupling. But this, indeed, this finding suggests uh, the breathing, the effect of breathing is, uh, is kind of common across this motor imagery and pure visual imagery. In addition, in this condition, we really make, we uh, wanted to make it purely visual, 
And still, the pure visual imagery was constrained by our breathing. Yeah, yeah. Uh, is it answer your question? Yes. Uh, he said okay. yes, and we we'll need to move on anyway. So let's thank Hyeongdo again. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Jitsu. All right, um, our next speaker is Patrick Grunberg from uh, Institute of Liberal Arts and Sciences, uh, Kanazawa University. He's going to talk about a heterological um, approach to conscious motor control evidence from phenomenology and behavioral neuroscience. The floor is yours. So, uh, thank you for the opportunity to present here today. Uh, yeah, my topic is uh, conscious motor agency, and I uh, have some uh, more general considerations and also ideas from um, motor control um, or muscle control that's combined with some um, uh, top down and bottom up approach. Uh, okay, now, uh, obviously, conscious motor control is a um, uh, complex phenomenon uh, combining um, cognitive and motor processes. Uh, on the one hand, we uh, conduct probably most of our movements in, um, in an automatic heavy chill manner. On the other hand, if we want or if we need to, now we can also initiate bodily movements in a self-controlled manner, né? just determining start, direction and speed of the movement, né? such as, uh, for example, during motor learning, a rehabilitation or motor control experiments. Um, my example, my case, is uh, quite a simple movement. So it's the self-controlled initiation of forward gait, thus making a first step from a standing stable posture. And uh, today I will briefly discuss uh, yeah, the common computational representational approach towards uh, a motor agency and point to uh, two impasses and then uh, explain about um, my hierarchical approach and point to a few applications of this model. Um, yeah, so the phenomenon I'm talking about is the conscious performance of I walk. So a subject uh, just standing and decides now I'm going over there, for example, and making a first step. Um, okay, um, so in uh, the common framework, um, uh, the common framework né, in terms of computational and representational processes, uh, the framework does usually not address the conscious and efficacious performance of motor control as the origin of behavior. Huh? So it is, uh, there is no efficacy of conscious motor agency. Uh, why uh, is this the case? I think it's the case because uh, conscious agency emerges from né, subpersonal unconscious motor control processes. So there's first motor control and then some uh, related consciousness. The central, uh, it's, this is all based on a neural control hierarchy né? Uh, from um, uh, cortical to spinal, finally to muscle control. Huh? So there's a top-down determination of muscle control. The central concept here are the um, internal models as a kind of neural representation of the mechanical properties of the limbs and the environment. There are inverse and direct models. I will not go into detail now with this. Um, um, just to summarize, they predict the consequences of an action and they, importantly, they are supposed to pre-compute uh, the requisite force time profiles to fit, uh, to fit specific motor tasks. And an, an important concept in this framework is the so-called efference copy that is supposed to suppress afferent signals resulting from self-initiated motion. And then uh, certain control and movement events, uh, such as the efference copy, induce a sense of agency. Uh, sense of agency as a personal and subjective experience can have many uh, forms, uh, like a sense of ownership, intentional causation, a sense of control or initiation, <clears throat> and uh, it occurs usually as a kind of phenomenal echo of the otherwise subpersonal processes. Um, importantly, direct muscle control is completely with uh, the subpersonal neural control mechanisms, huh? based on the internal models. Thus, there is a first subpersonal motor control and then perhaps Secondly, some sense of agency. 
So uh, the sense of agency comes as the uh, cherry on top of the subpersonal cake, meaning without any efficacy. And uh, so on, I think within this framework, there are two fundamental impasses. The first one is that the sense of agency as a secondary consciousness is uh, inefficacious. Then this, um, because the standard framework is bound to representational forms of consciousness, eh? representational forms that refer to some given content and can make this content, uh, content conscious in one or the other way. However, um, we did some, uh, we investigated patients engaging in uh, neural rehabilitation and um, uh, um, these, uh, their reports and also their behavior clearly shows that uh, subjects consciously exercise motor control, um, not only as a consciousness of some ongoing movement, but as their performance. So we have a different form of consciousness here, just as a side mark. Now the father of intentionality, Husserl discussed this also, that besides referring to a given reality, we have also kind of performative consciousness uh, and that does not refer to some given content as its content, but is uh, the immediate physical performance of mode control. So uh, this raises the question, how can a conscious performance exert direct motor control? Eh? Even if most movements occur automatically, eh, we have this uh, capability to use motion. I think. Uh, uh, a theory of conscious motor agency should also take into account this uh, particular case. Um, furthermore, this consciousness related problem points to a more fundamental problem in uh, current motor control theories. Um, that is the problem that direct top down muscle control is hardly incomputable. So, um, behavioral neuroscience shows that, uh, in terms of the problem of motor redundancy, that the pre programming of EMG signals, uh, of single EMG signals, is basically infeasible. Now, if we look at motor redundancy, uh, the, the fact that the number of muscles and joints, uh, the degree of freedoms, allow executing a movement towards a specific endpoint in different ways. Uh, and if we look at, if we uh, measure, uh, the same movement several times, one of the same movement is never conducted in the same way in kinematic and kinematic terms. No? So um, the problem is that the variables for determining single muscle activation, no? their joints and forces cannot be computed so beforehand. No? And we can also see this uh, that the um, also on the neural level that the uh, the non um, that um, a neural activity behaves in a non-linear way, it is uh, difficult to predetermine, eh? to pre-compute uh, these signals in detail. So this, uh, from the motor control viewpoint, also the question arises, what kind of neural motor control is actually feasible in a biophysical system as our body? So um, conscious motor control, uh, eh, um, the, the self-control initiation of movement uh, so requires to reconsider the entire motor control architecture and not only the relation between some subpersonal processes and uh, sense of agency related events. And uh, yeah, to cope with this problem, I uh, want to suggest a hierarchical model of motor control. Um, to introduce the idea of referent control as a parametric form of motor control, I want to uh, begin with a simple example. Eh? When riding a car, we usually do not need to know, but we do not need to understand the engine and the transmission. Eh? We uh, rather, it is enough to know where I want to go and how I can let the car drive eh? by manipulating certain parameters of the functioning of the car, eh? in particular speed, eh? by using accelerator and brake pedals and direction by using the steering wheel. If I can manipulate these two parameters, speed and direction, then I can completely rely on the car and the environment. And uh, the same counts for um, motor control. 
in the words of uh, Anatole Feldman, who proposed this approach, um, neural control levels uh, predetermined in the spatial domain, uh, where in the spatial domain neuromuscular events can work without prescribing how in detail they should work. Um, those parameters um, uh, set the criteria for the motor neural recruitment in terms of uh, the difference between actual and uh, threshold modelings, or what is also called the reference configuration. There are um, three levels or types of parameters for determining motor neural recruitment or setting a reference configuration. Eh? First one is the reference body location. So this concerns um, a frame of reference for possible body places in the environment. Uh, the second level is more specific about the body, the body configuration, for example, body balance uh, and the uh, possible impairments of the body. And uh, so it concerns the body in the terms of Feldman, the body geometry described in spatial coordinates. And uh, this level, the reference body configuration projects to uh, alpha and gamma motor neurons of all skeletal muscles of the body. So at this, uh, and then the second level, we have alpha and gamma motor neurons. The important aspect, the first two levels do not concern single muscles. It's always about the entire um, body control. And now in this uh, uh, sketch from uh, Feldman, you can, uh, so the idea is there's an actual body uh, location configuration. And then neural control nearly projects a new body location and configuration in terms of reference uh, location configuration. And then the neural system moves the body to this new location and configuration. But how single muscles implement the movement is uh, left to, um, uh, to the neuromuscular system and is not part of um, the referent control. Um, so, um, instead of uh, strictly hierarchical architecture uh, um, of subpersonal and additional personal processes, um, I want to suggest a heterarchical control architecture. And here the starting point is uh, what can be called a nexus of uh, um, conscious performance and neuromuscular events. That's the green part here in the center. Right? So we have the conscious performance of I walk, this act of initiation. And at the same time, this is what um, subjects can report about. Uh, we cannot observe objectively, obviously. But at the same time, we have some neuromuscular events, right? which of course can be measured. And uh, this type of the hetero architecture here in the for motor control uh, builds on two types of elements. Uh, we have, there are parametric or self-determinant control inputs and um, determined inputs. Those self-determinant inputs concern, for example, the uh, choice of the spatial goal and uh, possibly the speed of the intended action, the actual initiation and the performance or start of the movement, and, uh, for example, efforts to implement the movement in case of impairment or in case I have to climb up something. Determined or law constrained variables, né? determined inputs. This is something the system cannot manipulate. And it's in a sense given to the system. So uh, these uh, self-determinal parameters actually allow for motor control because they can be directly manipulated by the system. So on the level of the, um, uh, a body location, né? the system continuously receives um, visual and vestibular inputs about the position in the uh, environment and then uh, can um, set the new reference body location. Yeah? For example, I want to go over there. And uh, by doing so, there occurs a shift, there occurs um, uh, a deviation between the actual body location and the reference body location. And then the neural system seeks to um, bridge this deviation, to minimize this deviation by neuromuscular activity. However, on uh, at this level, 
the system uses uh, synergetic muscle control. Né? That means it's not control of single muscles, but also a group of muscles um, that act according to uh, certain patterns that yeah, human beings learn during their development. So, uh, central shifts in the referent body location uh, lead to this deviation and elicit shifts in the referent body configuration. Uh, so, um, changing body posture, uh, changing uh, body balance. And then again, if we have a shift in the referent body configuration, we have again a deviation with the actual body configuration uh, based on afferent inputs and somatosensory information. And again, on this level, we have uh, synergetic muscle control. And um, in order to minimize uh, these deviations, uh, these shifts are finally transmitted to uh, alpha and gamma motor neurons, né, which concern the, the um, um, mother links. And uh, those um, shifts in the activation threshold of alpha motor neurons finally lead to muscle activation. And in, um, from this viewpoint, physical locomotion then moves the body towards the new referent body location. Right? So central control here is uh, about spatial frames of reference. There is no pre-computing of single EM, EMG muscles, but the system relies on synergetic muscle activation and its uh, um, and the environment. After that point here, now, after these shifts, the implementation of the movement is completely left to the neuromuscular system. Right? So this is also in a low constraint uh, manner. Um, okay, let me briefly uh, summarize the idea of a heterarchical architecture. Uh, a heterarchy usually it, uh, is a continuum of structures yeah, that ranges from network to hierarchy. Yeah? So um, a heterarchy is not the opposite of a hierarchy, but a more complex structure. In order to express uh, varying interdependencies, in this case of uh, biophysical laws, uh, self determinate parameters, and the environmental constraints of a movement. In this case, we have a different orders. We have a clear hierarchical order in terms of the um, control inputs. However, we have also network relations, interdependencies between the agent and the environment. On the one hand, the agent is part of the environment. On the other hand, the agent manipulates the environment. And um, we have also interdependencies between a parametric and sensory inputs, né? which always are together. Né? That is, the deviation allows for muscle control. And these orders can occur in different configurations. That's a dynamic concept and which can change, adapt, or evolve situationally. And this is something what I want to uh, uh, come to now, to these uh, heterarchical configurations. Um, the idea is here to link this motor control theory to conscious motor agency is to identify né, acts of conscious motor control with these three kinds of shifts. And uh, I prepared a few examples. Né? The standard case may be a self-controlled habitual movement. Né? I may uh, decide the goal, I want to go over there and uh, start the movement, but I walk in a habitual manner. So I only say where I want to go, and the rest is left to the um, uh, habitual implementation. Uh, furthermore, if I have a uh, um, more spontaneous way of walking, I may I may decide to go over there, but I also modify the gait pattern. Eh? That is, for example, I walk particularly fast or carefully. Uh, so we have uh, two conscious performances in terms of these um, these two shifts. And uh, even furthermore, in terms of motor learning, we may also control single muscle activity. Né? For example, if we learn a new way of uh, walking or um, some uh, specific movements né, during training, we may, we may also sometimes control um, um, single muscle activity. So, um, it, so the conscious performance here is uh, the idea is equal to one of uh, these uh, shifts. In contrast né, to a self-controlled or habitual movement, automatic or habitual movement, uh, we have uh, none of these shifts. Né? Uh, that is probably most often the case when we do not uh, actually uh, think how to move or where to move. Okay, and uh, a brief 
conclusion regarding the uh, second problem, the kind of motor control. I think uh, that the idea here is based on reference control that um, the neural control system sets the parameters for muscle control, but there is no need to um, pre-compute any EMG signals, but rather determine the spatial frame of reference for synergetic muscle activation. Regarding the first issue, the efficacy of conscious motor control, within this model we can directly identify the, the conscious performance uh, with uh, one of these three um, parametric control inputs. And uh, they can be performed, they must not be performed consciously, right? if necessary, or if, uh, if we want to, we can perform them consciously. Uh, and in this sense, uh, this conscious uh, motor agency uh, forms an integral part of uh, motor control and not just a phenomenal extra. Okay, so far, thank you for your attention. Thanks. Um, I have a lot of questions. I really like it. Um, so to, yeah, focus on this. Um, you talk about how a central control is about the setting of spatial parameters of the movement. Um, this sounds a bit too narrow to me, uh, in a sense that there, there seems to be um, like more ways that we can control our movement. For example, um, one thing is that we can control the, um, the speed of the execution of the movement. Uh, it's not like spatial. And also, um, in the skill performance literature, um, people are talking about how a cognitive um, well, how cognition matters in uh, the performance uh, mm -hmm. in ways like um, if you're uh, you can prepare for certain threats for example um, if you're like riding a mountain bike and uh, you might um, plan in advance that if, if you're going to um, if you're going to encounter a certain kind of bump uh, you're going to uh, avoid it this way or that way you can prepare for those mm -hmm. things in advance and I think that's another way we can um, control movements uh, in a like central manner. So, uh, how would you consider um, those uh, aspects in, in your framework? Yeah, um, I completely agree. The the uh, the, the concept of uh, spatial parameters uh, I left uh, I, I I I did not explain in more detail. But actually, the idea here is also in the uh, in Feldman's motor control theory that within the spatial framework, of course, the speed and other uh, um, uh, variables may also be um, uh, part of those uh, shifts, so they, so they can be considered. It's, this uh, summary is more like due to simplicity and not going in detail today, but actually uh, uh, there's the goal of a movement, speed of a movement, and uh, yeah, there may be other factors as you just mentioned. Yeah, okay. So I think we can move on. Let's uh, thank Pat Patrick again. <laughs> Our next speaker and final speaker of this session is Anna Chaunika from Center for Philosophy of Science. University of Lisbon and also affiliated with uh, University College London. She's going to talk about why consciousness is not the same implication for artificial minds. Please. Uh, thank you so much, Tony, for um, having me here and um, also for you staying uh, despite the heat and everything. I also uh, have a disclaimer, so I'm uh, jet lagged. So if I talk nonsense, it's probably because I'm half conscious only. Yeah. So bear with me, yeah. So I'm going to assume that you don't know anything about me, so I'm going to start a bit with my uh, background. Hmm. So, um, and then I'm going to uh, try to convince you that we should stop talking about consciousness. <laughs> we should talk about conscious experiences. I'm going to give you some arguments why that. Uh, and then I'm going to end with some things that I'm cooking in my uh, oven in my lab in Lisbon, and some with some invitation of collaborations. Yeah. So um, I was trained as an armchair philosopher, and um, I don't think I need to um, describe the notion of qualia to the audience here. So I was like obsessed with uh, you know the subjective qualitative of uh, experiences. So and you all know the famous example of like seeing red tomato, right? The reddishness, the redness is like the famous there. Um, argument. Uh, but because I'm uh, French and I was, did my PhD in Burgundy, I was like, who cares about seeing red tomato? Just like, how about drinking red wine? <laughs> That's also a cool, yeah, right? It's like, why well, should focus on just on vision, right? It's not just like consciousness, it's not just about seeing tomato, right? 
So uh, Joe said the part. So um, I know there are a lot of like PhD students around here. So um, when I finished almost like the last year of my PhD, I was so fed up with uh, <laughs> my body problem. I was asking myself, why did I do this to myself? You know, I'm just like, <laughs> I'm done with uh, consciousness. I'm done with subjective qualitative experience and everything else. And then, uh, you know, people, I was going to conferences and people were asking me, it's like, well, can you tell me in one pitch, it's like, you know, what your thesis about, what you try to argue in your thesis, right? So I said, um, you know, like the pitch elevator, right? Can you tell in three sentences, like what you, what you're after, right? And I said, well, actually, I can, I can, I, I want to do a draw. <laughs> so I'm also a painter, so um, I, I did, I did a drawing. So I'm going to share with you the draw I did when I was a PhD student about why my head was like, might be a trigger. So bear with me, yeah. So here's the drawing. So uh, there's this idea that on one hand we have the pure mind, and the other hand we have the impure body, right? And there's somehow a tension, a division between the two, right? And as a very naive philosopher, I asked myself, it's like, where this comes from? I mean, why do we even talk about consciousness and mind? And, you know, where, where, what is the root of this? Yeah. And I spent some time to digging back into the literature, you know, the history of philosophy is like trying to figure out. So I'm going to rush you very, uh, uh, through a couple of slides. Bear with me. But I think the main idea is that, right? So um, the idea is like, where does it come from this idea that the mind or the conscious experiences are somehow different from the body and materialist uh, stuff, yeah? So I bump into, I mean, I bump into a lot of stuff, but one of the things that really drew my attention is this idea of the soma stemma theory, where basically soma means body, like somatic, yeah? And soma means tomb, yeah? So there's the idea that the body is the tomb for the soul, yeah? And basically, it's just a transition, like a tube, right? It's like it's coming, the soul is coming from somewhere and it's going elsewhere, but the body is just like a, you know, um, tube between, yeah? Uh, and then, you know, it's just a transitional phase, and then, um, yeah, this disappears. And then, obviously, it's like, we know that body disappears because we see people, you know, dying, and we decay. Um, so there's this idea, well, maybe there's something that actually doesn't really decay, it just like stays there, material, right? Um, so that was like, I think that's uh, the kind of like the click, yeah? And then we obviously, um, I'm rushing through, but then we have the Cartesian heritage coming from this type of like tradition. So this idea that somehow the conscious mind is a neither real, connecting to the world, the outside world by the senses, to only which I has privilege access about which it has incorrigible knowledge. So I have the self. And the conscious mind is a different sort of entity of the body, right? Doesn't depend on the existence of the body for functioning. And the conscious mind can grasp the nature of reality far more easily when it's not in contact with anything that's kind of like um, body. Yeah? So I like this as from the country because like, oh, <laughs> I really need to use this in my head. Yeah, because this idea is like, forget about your eyeballs, it's my voice, so you see the reality through um, the mind, yeah? Okay, so as I said, that's my background. So I was trained as an armchair philosopher, um, and um, when I finished my PhD, I was like, okay, I'm done with this, and I uh, did my postdoc in Switzerland, and I said, well, do I, I had like an existential crisis, like, do I really want to do this my entire life? And my question, my answer was like, no, <laughs> I, I don't want to do this. So I want to measure stuff, I want to just like, I'm more like Aristotelian than that to become that side, yeah. So I did a, um, a master in quantum neuroscience, um, while I was doing my postdoc in Switzerland philosophy, so basically I'm double training, I'm an interdisciplinary researcher. So right now, what I'm doing is like, I'm an armchair philosophy, jumping from armchair to the KPC, and I'm running a lab as a PI where basically I measure lots of stuff that is happening in the body. I'm using psychophysiological measures like respiration rates, heart rate variability, skin conductors, behavioral, qualitative, neurological, neural, <laughs> computational, and I'm doing this both in humans and artificial agents, right? So because I want to have like an interdisciplinary kind of like multi-scaled um, approach, yeah? So after uh, after this, I spent a couple of time, so like around five years, six years in London at the Institute of Quantum Neuroscience. And my job there was like a bit of philosophy in residence. And uh, 
my uh, uh my talk my task my job as a philosopher was to ask many questions so it's something like to the scientists just like what do you mean by perception <laughs> do you mean uh, can you please define here what is social all this stuff and then by the end of like the first year they all hated me um and one of the questions i asked i was asking all the time which is like look around you um you don't see kids in the room yeah it's like you see only adults actually study studying stuff they looked at each other and said, well, uh, <laughs> what do you mean? <laughs> it's like, and I said, I told you we should have a class, but it has nonsense questions. It's like, what do you mean there? And actually, I don't think it's, I don't think it's trivial. I want to point to why. I don't think it's trivial. Why? Because when we start to investigate, let's say, conscious experience, we only have like the lens of the other centric perspective, right? Yeah. But that's not how we arrive. In the world, right? With each individual, it's like Athena from Zeus head, we are developed, right? So, and why is this important? I'll give you one example. It's an example, but I can give you tons of examples. So, suppose you want to build a minimal model of this system, yeah, the hand of the human. So, if you take the adult centric perspective, then you might be very tempted to squeeze the properties of the system that you have at other level, which is like put it in miniature. I say, well, actually, this is a minimal model of that system, yeah? But that can't be the case because if you take actually development and take how things are evolving to become a plant, then you can see that the property at a certain stages are very different than the properties that they have at certain stages, right? So if you really want to understand how the, what the plant is, what a human is, what a human experience is, it's not enough to actually focus on snapshots at one single stage. You need to look at how basically things um, evolve. And that is going to give you basically a more ecological and valid picture of what exactly um, the conscious experience is. So starting from that, my, my job is, so my aim in my research, in my lab, is I want to understand how uh, we uh, develop conscious experiences from scratch, right? So I want to go back to school run. Yeah. So I don't want to understand what consciousness is. I want to understand how we become self-conscious or conscious of the environment, right? So how we get there, right? Because you can't define consciousness if you don't understand how we get there in the first place, yeah? Um, and I, I work within uh, the body cognition paradigm, and the idea is that um, brain and minds, they don't occur in a vacuum, right? Um, they uh, develop and they have dedicated systems to control the survival of the, of, of the organism, right? Um, and if we take this as a starting point, then, um, well, one, we need to recognize that our bodies don't develop first in a vacuum either, right? They develop within another body. So why I'm stressing this? I'm saying this because I think it's really important. I'm going to continue to say this even though my career I think that when people talk about pregnancy, they automatically, implicitly associate this experience with a certain category of people that have the ability to carry babies in their bodies. But if you look at the phenomena from the perspective of developing human, all of you here, you share the body with another person, yeah, successfully, because otherwise you wouldn't be here. So what I want to say is like, you know, lab, and this is why I named my lab the cotton body itself, well, it's because that experience is universal. It doesn't concern some individuals, it concerns all of us to date. Yeah. yeah. So I'm starting with this very basic idea. It's like, okay, you want to understand the body, you need to understand body within the body case, and then take it from there. Yeah. Um, and this is something that we approached in this uh, paper with um, uh, Adam and Jonathan. Basically, we take all the you know existing uh, theories of consciousness and say, Table say, well, what will be the implication basically if you go back to the score one and just like endorse this perspective? Yeah. Um, and also, as I said, it's like going back to my obsession with tomatoes and red wine. It's just like when you look to the literature, that's actually this is something we say in the paper. It's just like it's like because of the adult centric bias, and because as adults we rely so much on vision, yeah. It's like to understand reality. We tend to do all our experiments, consciousness experiments on like visual perception. But that's not how we first start to experience the world through vision. Yeah. We have other senses that come first, it's possible like touch and actually somehow related with 
uh, what Ophelia said earlier is like, why the sense of reality is so important and related to tactile experiences as well, because that's robust. First of all, touch, the skin is the larger, largest of your sensory organs and the oldest is the first to develop because I cannot switch it off even when you sleep. So you receive sensory input from tactile experiences, even in sensory deprivation times, right? So you can't cut off the vision, but it can't cut off tactile experiences. <laughs> so that's a way to actually for the body to monitor reality, yeah? Um, so there's a lot of work, I mean, this is just like, I'm sorry about the packed slides, it's just like, I'm, I'm plus one, I'm allowed some text on my slides. So, um, <laughs> There is a lot of work on, uh, um, on vision, yeah, uh, visual consciousness. There is some early work on um, tactile detection and auditory modality, and it's getting more and more there. So there's some nice work, for instance, like by um, um, uh, RT analysis uh, showing that um, patients in coma that uh, show responses to olfactory uh, stimuli that actually um, have better chances to recover and become fully conscious later on, so that's a strong prediction, yeah? So there is some work, but basically it's like just mostly vision, yeah? So here is um, what, it, what we want to say in this paper, it's just like why there's like the, I mean the kind of like cheeky title I put is like why consciousness is another thing. I think there is the danger of like using the term consciousness as a noun to, uh, uh, especially if your one is not carefully, you know, using it, is like to implicitly attribute to this like term properties that can't have in its own right. So I don't think consciousness can be something like can be measured as a thing per itself, right? Um, and you can see, I don't know how many of you basically saw the upload series. Did you saw the upload series? No. Okay, so uh, here's a pitch, I'm not going to give you the spoiler. So basically, um, in the future, so if you are rich enough, you can upload your self-consciousness into a virtual body, and you can live there forever, yeah? So that's kind of like the pitch. So this, this idea that somehow consciousness is kind of like a ball or a set of like information that just like put a USB key and just like transfer from one body to another from one real body to the actual body, yeah. So I think that's um, that's problematic. So what I want to say is just like, we should talk about consciousness in relation to something else, like experience, state, processes, information processing, I don't care. Just like something, you know, <laughs> it's happening. It's something, it's something, it's happening dynamically, yeah. So this idea that, well, we shouldn't talk about consciousness, but we should talk about conscious experiences. And experiences are, this is coming from uh, something I worked on with Martina Rita Grimelin, who's my uh, supervisor um, in uh, Freiburg, in Switzerland. So, here's the argument. So, experience of particular spatial temporal events that consist in instantiation of experiential properties by experiential subjects. So, this means that experiences do not occur in a vacuum, but are intrinsically linked between experiencing subject, someone, right? So, you cannot talk about the experiences like frozen in the air. So this is good. I think it's like we cannot even think of the appearance of an experience without thereby thinking of involving an experience in subject. Hence, the no notion of experience in subject is conceptually prior to the notion of experience, and the notion of experience conceptually prior to the notion of consciousness. Yeah. So that's that's the major thing. Yeah. So this means that any attempt to understand consciousness, whatever that means, means yeah, cannot be done isolated from experiencing subjects, yeah? And this emphasis is not trivial, because as this happens with someone and the viewer, the experience is not an abstract entity, right? Floating in abstract space. And if we take the case of humans, they are embodied living organisms actively engaged with the wider physical and social environment. And as I said, it's not even embodied, it's actually fundamentally co-embodied from the first place, yeah? So this means that if consciousness cannot be addressed in isolation from experiences, then the latter cannot be addressed in isolation from experiences subjects, which in turn cannot be uh, addressed in isolation from the body and the closest environment. But as I said, the most primitive and closest environment of a, a developing experiencing subject is another experiencing subject. And I'm emphasizing this because it's something I'm 
really working on, and we almost have paper accepted, accepted on this. I got very good news like yesterday. It's just like the uterus is not an object. <laughs> From a biological perspective, that's a self organizing biological system. So this means that at the very low level, we have an experience of structure related to another experience of structure, like biological system, yeah. So this means that I really want to, I really want to go back to the square one to understand how this kind of like experiencing subjects relate to, um, to the most primitive world. And this is something that, that I already published on, uh, this um, uh, brilliant people. Um, so we looked, we take a brief the processing account, so basically we kind of like uh, merge two uh, ideas. On one, one hand, you have the embodied cognition approach. You said, well, you know, it's like the self, what we experience right now is the product of like all the past activities, history of our activities, which is, I think is fine. On the other hand, it's like people from, let's say, the pre processing account say, well, we don't actually experience or perceive the world as it is, but we experience the world as we predict it, we expect it to be, right? Yeah. But that's the case. Well, clearly, we need to go back really when the first part. Right, because those will give you very clear hints about how exactly we perceive the world right now. We can actually simply um, ignore them. Yeah, and uh, this is what I've done already, um, and I'm continuing to do uh, on already starting uh, in uh, YouTube. And I'm very careful to use the world experiences, sensory experiences. I'm not using the world consciousness at all. Yeah, in this case. Uh, so as I said, it's just like we supposed to zoom out from the classic conundrum relationship between consciousness and neural correlates. I'm not interested in this because as I said I I believe that the distinction between mind and body permeates our discussions right now and improving the distinction between brain and body. I don't find any convincing argument for someone to tell me why the brain is not body. And where exactly the brain ends and where exactly the body begins, right? So I think the brain body distinction is something that we inherited from Cartesian mind body to all this, yeah? It's a tacit thing, yeah. Um, and um, we push back. So as I said, I was like, what I'm really interested in, I want to go back to the impure body, go back to the animal. I think we should focus, if you want to understand what conscious experience are in humans, we need to understand what connects the humans. Um, as a biological system to um, the rest of the um, biological living systems. Um, and this is something that we recently published this year, and it's a radical claim. Um, we say the brain is not mental. Uh, so, so, well, maybe actually we should forget about neurons altogether. I mean, neurons is cool, are cool. Well, okay, so I'm going to leave aside the fact that if you take the development perspective, the first neurons to develop, and as those one in the brains, but actually the one in your tummy, yeah, so those are the first neurons, yeah. Uh, so let's leave that aside. So, um, so let's focus on the fact that um, actually let's, let's forget about just neurons and zoom, on, zoom in the cells, because actually neurons are a type of cells, right? So basically, we look at the cellular processing in relation to the immune system. Why? Why the immune system? Because, again, if you take a development perspective, yeah, um, you need a system in place to tell this bunch of cells um, um, what is the cell, what is not the cell, right? To, you know, to self-organize, to have a biological self-organizing system. And that's something that, um, it's, it's, I think this has been uh, overlooked in the literature, and I'm, I'm pushing a lot on that side because I think it's, it's crystal important. Uh, so I, I work on the neural and immune cellular processing in human organisms in uh, Tandem, yeah. But I think that's, uh, that's very important. And um, yeah, so I think the immune system is the system that tells the people where the self ends and when the self uh, begins. Yeah. Um, so I will probably need to, to uh, wrap up to, to, to jump in. Okay, so um, actually I was expecting this because I saw that people were kind of like over going through their times. Yeah. Uh, so I was seeing, well, I'm the last speaker, I'm a female, so I'll probably be asked to wrap up and be uh, on time. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to just give it to the liberty. Thank you. Well, yeah, sorry, can we can we go back to slide twenty twenty one? Yes, this one. So, 
So here, the, the important claim is that the notion of an experience is conceptually prior to the notion of consciousness. So in order for this claim to be uh, to be true, what you talk about, what you mean by experience must be different from what you mean by consciousness. The two things must be different, but, yeah. but I would say that I would use the term consciousness to refer to what you uh, what you term experience here. So uh, what do you mean by consciousness? Yeah, that's, 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 that's something yeah. different from experience. Yeah. So that's a very good point. So um, in the paper I'm writing right now, uh, I basically make a distinction between two way of understanding experience. So one is the typical of type that people talk about the experience, like experiential, like the phenomenal thing, right? Which is likeness, yeah, experiential aspect. But what I want to say is there is another way of understanding experience, which is experience like going through this epistemological distinction, right? It's like I have experience in opening wine bottles because I previously uh, Opened a lot of like uh, wine bottles, so it's it's an exploration, it's a tacit exploration, it's a living through, it's an ontological commitment, right? So in that case, I can have experiences. So for instance, like when you sleep, you have experience in the sense while well, you receive information from the environment, and there is a lot of work on this. For instance, like people sleeping in very busy cities uh, because you still hear auditory input, right? You're actually less. Um, um, less um, how should I put it? Uh, less rested, right? Because you, you're processing this like uh, subliminally all the time. So maybe you don't have a feeling what it is likeness at that particular point, what it is like for you to actually sleep in a noisy environment, but you did have experience in the sense like you went through that thing, like sensory processing. Yeah. So I'm so and so in that case, I would say yes. Even in utero, and even as an infant, even though maybe you don't not explicitly recall what it is like for you to actually have that experience from like looking for the nipple or just like being hungry, but you did you did it in the sense like experience in the sense of like exploration. You went there, right? So that's that's the, the so actually I'm I'm using the term experience in that sense, first sense like exactly what exploring means. So that experience means etymologically, which is like experiencing stuff, yeah. And I would say that, and that I think that's a useful distinction for artificial agents, because artificial agents do explore, robots explore, right? So have studies with robots that kind of like go through the stuff, like exploring, gathering, yeah, sensory information. But the real question is like, whether they have experience in the second sense, and it's like experience of like, what is like, no, no. And that's a different thing. And that's hard from the I don't address, that's not my thing, yeah. I'm a focus on just the first one. Yeah. All right, thank you all, and that's a wrap up.